to be able to see his work. Uh, so Andrew, he got his PhD in Oxford University in 86, and then he, he was a, a postdoc for some time in Oxford, and also I think that MIT for some time. Uh, two years, yeah. Two years, yeah. Then you have been moving around a bit, so you went to uh, Bath University, then you were at the Stanford and uh, Warwick University until you finally moved to the, to Caltech in uh, a few years ago, I think, in 2016. Uh, and yeah, currently you are a, 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 the Ben Professor of Computational and Math Science, and I think that you're going to talk about uh, applications, uh, some applications of computational math, um, and try to understand physical system using, using data-driven sampling methods. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'd, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions as we go um, through the chat or through the Q&A. Um, that will uh, help our understanding, me of you and you of me, as we go along. So please, please do ask questions and Adrian will convey them to me. Um, the topic of the talk is about solving optimization problems and sampling problems without using derivatives. And a particular focus will be the use of ensemble Kalman methods. Um, the work is joint with a large number of people. It's an overview, and I will highlight to you who those people are in a few moments. But let me tell you about the structure of the talk. Um, talk will come in two halves, one devoted to filtering, the first half, and the second half devoted to the use of filtering to solve inverse problems. And within filtering, I'm going to emphasize ideas coming from mean field dynamics and ensemble Kalman methods. And I will show an application in weather forecasting. And within the solution of inverse problems, I'm going to focus on insights coming from studying continuous time limits of the algorithms. And I will show an application in medical imaging. So the ideas that I would like you to come away from this talk with are these five bullets here. I'd like to explain to you how ensemble common methods can be used as a method of solving optimization problems and sampling problems without the use of derivatives. I want to also show you how they can be used not only for filtering problems, which is state estimation given noisy observations in a dynamical system, but also how the ideas transfer readily to the solution of inverse problems in a quite general framework. And from a math point of view, I will be, as I just said, the insights I would like you to pick up from this talk are the use of mean field formulations of interacting particle systems to um, motivate their derivation and also to streamline their analysis and the use of continuous time limits for the same purpose, to understand the, how the algorithms work um, and to do so in a clean manner where the principal ideas are exposed in a clear fashion. And I believe both the mean field perspective and the continuous time perspective contribute to our understanding of the algorithms by providing a clarity on how they work. And I will, as I've said, provide applications in weather forecasting and medical imaging. And I re-emphasize that I welcome questions. Okay, there, there are alternative mean field approaches that I will uh, mention here in, in a aside. And, and this just leads me to remember that the slides for this talk, which have about 40 references in them, um, are available on the website. Kate Nelson will put them up there after this talk. So if you want to follow up on the details of the um, references to other work in this area, um, please take a look at those slides. Um, my collaborators are numerous and they will come up uh, during the talk, all listed here. But the particular perspective that I'm giving on ensemble Kalman methods it follows from a paper that I'm currently writing with Eduardo Calvello, who's a PhD student at Caltech, and Sebastian Reich, who's a professor and leading expert in data assimilation at the University of Potsdam. Okay, so let me start by discussing filtering, uh, show you the framework in which I'm working, and develop algorithms and ways of thinking about algorithms for this problem. So this particular slide is important because it establishes notation and assumptions 
that will prevail throughout the talk. So what I'm describing to you here is, if you look at the first two equations, they are a pair of coupled equations that describe a dynamical system and an observation system that is constructed from the dynamical model. So the dynamical model, it's the evolution of a state VN dagger um, governed by a noisy dynamical system. So psi is systematic, non-random, and the system is assumed to be subject to, in this case, Gaussian noise, which is centered and has covariance sigma. And the observation at time n plus one is found as a nonlinear function h of the signal with the addition of Gaussian noise. And for simplicity, I will also assume the initial condition is Gaussian. And more important for this work is the assumption on the independence of the initial condition, the driving noise in the dynamics model and the driving noise in the data model. The Gaussian assumptions can readily be extended. However, the independence assumption is crucial. Okay, so a high level look at what I've just described is as follows. What, what would we like to do here? We'd like to compute an estimate of the state, Vn plus one dagger, given our accumulation of observations, y n plus one dagger. So if I let uppercase yn denote the accumulation of observations from time one up to time n, then we're interested in computing in a probabilistic formulation of this problem, the state of the system, Vn dagger, conditioned on the observations up to time n. And that is governed by a probability measure mu. And I want to describe in the panel above, at a very high level, how that probability distribution evolves. It evolves according to two equations, one of which, the first, describes the underlying dynamics, and I call this prediction. So this is simply applying the Markov kernel that governs the dynamical system that I've described here for the dynamics model. That is a linear operation, which takes the probability measure mu n, which captures the signal at time n given the data up to time n, and maps it into a prediction of the state at time n plus one. We then apply Bayes' theorem, which incorporates the data, the new piece of data at time n plus one, and maps the prediction mu n plus one hat into another measure mu n plus one through the application of Bayes' theorem. And I'm writing Bayes' theorem through the operation ln, l for likelihood. Um, this operation is nonlinear. So if we compose these two, we get a mapping from mu n to mu n plus one, and that is the dynamical system that governs, governs the evolution of the probability distribution of the state given the data up to time n. And I will show you that on the next slide. So composing those two, we have this high level picture of the filtering problem as a mapping from measure mu n, which describes the state of the system at time n, given data up to time n, into the same object at time n plus one, the state of the system at time n plus one, given the observations up to time n plus one. And the mapping taking mu n to mu n plus one is the composition of a linear operator, Markovian, and a nonlinear operator, which is Bayes' theorem. And the classical method, which works well for low dimensional state estimation, the classical approach to solving this problem, for which there's a long history going back several decades, is through particle approximation. So particle approximation works as follows. I, I'm going to introduce this notation. So SJ pi denotes a mapping on probability measures, which is computed by sampling J times, uppercase J times from the probability measure and making an empirical measure through weighting Dirac masses centered at these points UJ. And weighting by one over J makes SJ pi a probability distribution given that pi is a probability distribution. And the particle method, which is 
widely used in engineering and very successful in low dimensional problems, takes the form that you see highlighted in blue. We simply interpose the sampling operation SJ between the prediction and the um, application of Bayes' theorem. There are many variants on this, but this is the basic idea. And um, crucial to understand is that this is a convergent algorithm. So let me highlight that mu n is a probability distribution that we are interested in, the state given the data, and mu n j is our approximation of that probability measure given this sampling operation using j random samples at every step n of the algorithm. Um, and important to appreciate is that this is a convergent method. And um, proving convergence of the method again goes back several decades, but I particularly like this presentation of uh, Repshini and Van Handel. Um, in a particular metric on random probability measures, the probability measures are random because of the sampling operation I just described to you. Um, but th the details are not important for this talk. There is a metric uh, under which the distance between the true filtering distribution mu n and the particle approximation mu n j is bounded above by a Monte Carlo error of size one over root j. So if one fix an interval that one is interested in with n up to uppercase n, um, then the error is bounded by a constant that depends on uppercase n multiplied by one over root j. So as j goes to infinity, this will tend to zero and you will recover the true filtering distribution, the estimation of the state given the data. So that's all very positive, but it is important for this talk to understand that the constant C of n depends very badly on the dimension of the state space in which the signal Vn dagger lives. And uh, that's commonly referred to as the problem of weight collapse, which plagues this methodology in high dimensions. And I'm telling you all this because um, this fact is the motivation for where I'm going in the rest of the talk, which is at a very high level into the realm of approximate methods which do not necessarily converge, but which have been demonstrably successful in solving a wide range of problems in science and engineering of the type that I described as filtering. Okay, so the methods I describe in this talk are not yet fully understood from a mathematical perspective. They make approximations, but they are very widely used and they are very widely used, especially in high dimensional problems. And this theorem and the failure of this theorem because of the large size of the constant C of N in high dimensional problems is the motivation for the methods I'm going to now move on and discuss. So let me just pause and ask if there are any questions up to this point about notation, motivation, or anything. Okay, well, I, I welcome them at any time, so please feel free to, to put questions in the chat or Q&A. All right, so I'm going to now head towards uh, introducing- so we have a question. Tom I have yeah. my, and you have a question in the chat by yeah. David. Like if these these methods they only cover the continuous spaces? Um, no, you can do thank you. That's a good question. So I've described this um in continuous space um in RD, but uh, the methods can be used conceptually, the methods work in finite or countable state spaces, and also can be generalized to um Banach or Hilbert space. Thank you. Also, people, the, the, you should also feel free to chime in if you want. You can write in the chat and monitor the chat, or if anyone just wants to unmute and ask the question, that's also fine. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I, I'm going to head towards ensemble Kalman filtering, but before I do that, I want to look at filtering from the perspective of. We, we actually have another question. Yes, I please. Ask, is there a general rule of thumb for when the CN is too large? like because of dimensionality. Is yes, so you will see it in the algorithm. Um, so th this phenomenon of weight collapse is something that's manifest in the algorithm. At each step of the algorithm, one computes weights when one applies Bayes' theorem. And 
um, if those weights are distributed in a way so that many of them are tiny and one of them is large, they, they need to sum to one. Um, the, the, the weight collapse is a phenomenon that alerts you to the fact that uh, this, um, this problem has arisen. And I've, I've described the most basic form of filtering, but, uh, and there are improvements on it, but all of them will suffer from, in general, this weight collapse problem. And it's very evident when you run the algorithm. Um, there's a, a computation of something called effective sample size, which quantifies what I've just said and tells you when this issue arises. And is this a limited to linear problems? Is that no, no not at all. This is um, a very general methodology that applies to nonlinear. Uh, let me just show you the, the model at the beginning. Um, psi and H can be nonlinear, and there's no need for these noises to be Gaussian either. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to look at a perspective on filtering that comes from mean field dynamics and then look at Kalman methods from this perspective. And there's an interesting history to this um, approach, both in discrete and continuous time. And there's a very nice recent paper by Spantini, Baptista and Mazouk, uh, Youssef, um, in 2019, which uh, shares a lot in common with the perspective that I'm about to describe to you. Um, so, the idea of uh, mean field dynamics approach to filtering is this, that um, we want to map, we want, I want to create a dynamical system that takes Vn to Vn plus one in such a way that the distribution of Vn is equal to the filtering distribution. So that is, is equal to the distribution on the state Vn dagger given the observations up to that time. Okay, so I'm trying to write down something which is a stochastic dynamical system, but whose law is equal to the filtering distribution. Now, this is a conceptual idea, it's not an algorithm, but it gives rise to algorithms and I will explain how. But the, the basic idea I'd like you to focus on is this. So we start with Vn on assumed to be distributed according to the filtering distribution on the state given the data up to time n, and we map it forward under this dynamical system. That is the original dynamical system we're given to make a predicted dynamic Vn plus one hat. Similarly, from the predicted dynamic from the state, we also predict data Yn plus one hat. And then we effect, and this is conceptual at the moment, but we effect a mapping TS, which I refer to as perfect transport, which takes the state Vn plus one hat, the predicted state and the predicted data, takes their distribution nu n plus one. And it's crucial to observe that this map TS depends, depends on a probability distribution. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment and takes the observed data at time n plus one and does so in such a way that overall the dynamical system in the first panel maps the filtering distribution on the state given the data at time n uh, into Vn plus one, which is distributed according to the filtering distribution at time n plus one. Okay, now if for a moment you uh, allow us to assume that we know the existence of such a TS, then this looks like the basis of a methodology. Um, so let's just assume for the moment that we have such a mapping. And let me say that the existence of such maps is um, fairly straightforward. Uh, uniqueness does not hold. There are many ways of doing this, but perhaps the simplest, if you want to understand and take away one particular method is to just think of optimal transport. So op optimal transport can be used to map um, these, which are distributed according to nu n plus one into the distribution mu n plus one, different from nu n plus one, which is found as the conditional distribution on this piece of data of Vn. So maps TS exist and um, Yusuf, um, Yusuf Mazouk, who is at MIT, is uh, a leading world authority on this subject area. And not only the computation of such maps, but their use 
in many problems, including inverse problems and the filtering problem that I'm currently discussing. So this is a, a very nice conceptual way of thinking about how one might derive algorithms, but it's not yet an algorithm. Firstly, um, I haven't, TS is not unique, so we haven't discussed how to determine it. But um, there's also another issue, which I want to highlight, which is that this is, um, I will refer to this as a nonlinear Markov process because this mapping here depends on its own law, okay? So the mapping here that is being written down is a mapping which depends on the law of the variables that we are computing as through the stochastic dynamical system. So most standard Markov processes lead to a linear map, what I called P beforehand, but here this, these are nonlinear Markov processes. But if for a moment you allow me to assume that we have such a TS, then you can compute an algorithm from this um, by particleizing it. So what do I mean by that? Well, rather than taking a single particle prediction, we make an ensemble of predictions, J of them. And rather than making a, a single prediction of the data, we make an ensemble of predictions, uppercase J of them too. Using them, we can approximate the measure nu n plus one on the predicted state and the predicted data. And we can insert that empirical approximation into the map TS. And that will give us a map which takes us to the particle Vn plus one J um, in such a manner that it depends on all of the previous particles Vnj. This is now a linear Markov process, but it's on a high dimensional state space. This, excuse me, this nonlinear Markov process is if we look at it as a Markov process mapping mu n to mu n plus one, these are supported on the space where the dynamics live, Rd. Um, but the, ma the, the, ma the mapping is nonlinear. This, well, once we particleize this, we get a linear Markov process, which lives not on Rd, but on the product of Rd with itself, J times, where J is the number of particles. And this, sorry, this is an implementable algorithm if one has the mapping TS. And indeed the paper by Spantini, Baptista and Marzouk that I referred to earlier uh, implements an algorithm very much in the spirit with a specific choice of TS. Okay, so the, the key idea that I've um, highlighted in the last two slides is that by thinking of mean field models, those are models which depend on their own law, one can write down dynamical systems whose law is equal to the filtering distribution. By approximating them with particle systems, you get implementable algorithms, um, which in the large particle limit will recover the filtering distribution. And key to understanding why this might be a good idea is that this algorithm intrinsically has equal weights. And the issue of collapse, which plagued the particle filter is at this high level dealt with. Okay, so these methods are very attractive for that reason. And they are, however, difficult to implement because the computation of TS is in many cases prohibitive. So Yusuf and co-workers have made great advances in this and there are definitely problems where it is possible to compute TS, but um, to do so in a general purpose fashion, I think still remains a, a, a significant challenge. So what I'm going to do now is show you an approximation of TS, which is implementable, but will lose the exact property that we have Vn and Vn plus one distributed according to the filtering distribution. So I'm going to make an approximation, and this will lead us to ensemble Kalman methods. But perhaps I could just pause here and ask if there are any questions on this mean field perspective, because it is central to the talk. Okay, well, I, I welcome questions. Do, don't, you can interrupt me at any time. Okay, so I'm going to look at the ensemble Kalman method, the original Kalman paper 
as many of you will know, goes back to the early 1960s. Kalman spent a lot of time at MIT. The ensemble Kalman paper is due to Evanson, who is a um, Norwegian geoscientist and introduced it in the context of ocean modeling. And the link to optimal transport, um, I particularly highlight this paper of Sebastian Reich from 2013. So I'm going to make an approximation of the map TS. And let me just show you explicitly what it is. So th this is the map TS here. And I'm working here at the level of a mean field model. So this is not yet an algorithm. We will particleize it to get an algorithm. But th this is a mapping, the same flavor as before. We are trying to find VN, which approximates the filtering distribution, whose distribution is approximately the filtering distribution. We predict the state and we predict the date, the um, observations. And then we map in the following way. So those of you who have a background in control will recognize this as um, somewhat similar to um, Kalman gain and more generally to the idea of Lewenberg observer. So what we're doing here is mapping the predicted state into a new state, Vn plus one, by use of a gain, which I will, whose computation I'll describe in a moment, um, acting on something that's a bit like an innovation. It's a comparison of the observed data with the predicted data. And the gain is computed by, from, okay, the, the details of this may be complicated to read formula-wise, but th these are just the distributions of, sorry, these are just the um, covariances in the data space, CYY, and the cross covariance from the data space to the state computed with respect to the distribution nu n plus one of the predicted state and the predicted data. So key point to appreciate is that, so th these are nonlinear, maps, but Markovian. And here we have a nonlinear Markovian map because this gain depends on the law of Vn plus one hat, All right? So this is a nonlinear Markov process on Rd. And why are we doing this? Well, in the case where nu n plus one is Gaussian, this is perfect. So th this map, the TS map that's defined by this formula here, exactly implements conditioning. And that's why this looks like the Kalman filter in the, the gain here looks like the gain in the Kalman filter. All right, so this is an, a nonlinear Markov process. It maps Vn to Vn plus one, and it, and it does so to Vn plus one, it does so in a manner that depends on the law of this predicted state and predicted data. Right, so th this is a very computable TS, um, and this leads directly to the algorithm that is widely used, which is the ensemble Kalman filter. So I'm now going to particleize this. So that is, I'm going to introduce uppercase J predictions of the state and the data. And I'm going to use those to empirically approximate the data covariance and the cross covariance from the data space to the state space. And that gives rise to an implementable algorithm. And this is the common filter, the extend the ensemble common filter. I've come at it in um, a manner that is not historically the way it was derived but it's a manner which I think is, um, pr provides lots of insight and it connects to modern methods for approaching the problem, such as those being developed by Youssef and his co-workers. So wh what do we have? We have, as before, we have a collection of uppercase J predictions of both the state and the data. And then from those, we compute an empirical probability measure and that, that means that when we compute these covariance in data space, 
and the covariance, cross covariance from data space to state space, these are computed empirically using the particles. And then the, each particle is updated according to the map TS with the gain computed empirically from the set of particles. Right, so this is a, a linear Markov process on the, on the um, product space. If the original dynamical system for the state lives in RD, then this is a linear Markov process on J copies of RD. So again, let me highlight why I think the nonlinear Markov process perspective is illuminating. Um, for the point of view of understanding the algorithms, the nonlinear Markov process is, is a very concise way of understanding what's happening. It is a Markov process on RD, um, but is nonlinear as a, as a mapping on probability measures but it's on RD. What we implement here in the particle system is on J copies of RD, it's linear. And there's a trade-off in terms of understanding and getting insight uh, in these two perspectives. But I would say that the linear particle method whilst being appropriate for implementation is less insightful in terms of understanding many of the phenomena related to these algorithms than the nonlinear Markov process perspective which is essentially the mean field limit where one looks at large numbers of particles. You lose some things by doing this, but you get a lot of insight. And that's one thing I would like you to take home from this talk. Okay, now that this um, method, the ensemble Kármán filter is designed to be exact in the mean field limit when psi and H are linear. And as a consequence, you can prove convergence of it to the Kármán filter uh, in the case where psi and h are linear. And there is a paper by Leglande that does this um, a decade and a half ago or so. And a um, slightly different metric from the one I described before for the particle filter, but the same basic message. One obtains the Monte Carlo rate of convergence one over root j. But in practice, this is observed to behave much better than the particle filter in high dimensions because it never reweights, and you always have particles that are equally weighted com combining together to make an approximation of the distribution of interest. Okay, so this is a convergent method for linear Gaussian dynamical systems, but it is used, and that was where it was originally introduced, for nonlinear state estimation problems. There's two senses in which nonlinear occurs in this talk. The dynamical system itself is always, or, or can be always nonlinear. Um, that's different from the Markov process that arises from the dynamical system, which may or may not be nonlinear, uh, depending on the setting. Okay, let me show you uh, and try and convince you by means of looking at weather forecasting that uh, this method is valuable and works well in practice. So before I talk about the ensemble karma method, I wanna take a step back and just show you something related to an algorithm called 3D VAR, which was a prevalent method for weather forecasting several decades ago and came out of the UK uh, Met Office. 3D VAR, for those of you who know the extended Kármán filter, is a, a bit like the extended Kármán filter, but with the um, tangent linearization calculated um, according to average statistics and not updated at every time step. So we, that's referred to as climatology. Um, key point about 3D VAR is that for, um, and, and this uh, extends to ensemble Kármán methods, but I just show it to you for 3D VAR, is that um, if you choose the parameters in it correctly, um, by observing a chaotic dynamical system, it's possible to stabilize it and make predictions. So what you see here is a comparison. This is computed with um, incompressible Navier-Stokes equations on a periodic domain um, in a regime with Reynolds numbers such that there are on the order of 50 positive Lyapunov exponents. And the, so prediction would in general be difficult without observations. But the, the key idea uh, of observability really from control theory is that if we observe enough of the unstable dynamics, we can control 
the predictions and predict accurately. So what you see here is a comparison of blue, which is projection of the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation onto a particular Fourier mode, um, and magenta, which is the prediction of the 3D VAR algorithm, which is like an averaged extended Kármán filter. And there, is, there are parameters in the 3D VAR algorithm. And what I'd like you to observe is that uh, when the parameters are tuned badly, the prediction is poor, but if they're tuned well, the prediction is good. So, excuse me, on the, on the right-hand side, you see a prediction. Notice here the time scale is much longer as well. On 15 time units, we're, we're accurately predicting the signal. But something else to notice about this is that um, we did have to tune parameters to make this work. And in this case, we knew the truth. So the beauty of the ensemble Kármán method, and that's something I will try and explain to you in the context of inverse problems, is that there's a sense in which it automatically tunes itself to the data and leads to effective algorithms without having to tune, but using information from the data to self-tune during the dynamics. And I'll explain to you a bit about that uh, in the context of inverse problems later. Here, I just want to show you a quantitative comparison of the ensemble Kármán filter with the 3D VAR method. Um, both of them have this attribute that they can effectively predict chaotic dynamical systems um, because of observability, but ensemble method does so more efficiently. So this is a computation courtesy of Roland Potas, who works at the German Weather Forecasting Service. And what this shows, excuse me, is the accuracy, which is um, a number between zero and one. Here, the axis is from 0.5 to one, it's called skill. Um, the accuracy of the prediction uh, based on ensemble Kármán filter and based on 3D VAR. And for a given skill, let's say we want 90% accuracy, 0.9, um, we can compute by looking at the intersection of this straight line across at skill 0.9, we can look at how many hours forward one is able to predict with 90% accuracy. The gap between the blue and the red line is several hours and shows the advantage of using the ensemble Kármán filter, which is red, over the 3D VAR method, which is blue. So where one hits across, say, 90% accuracy, where you hit, you come down onto this axis and it tells you how long you are accurate for. So at 90% accuracy, 3D VAR um, works for around 60 hours, um, but the ensemble Kármán method for more like 80 hours. So this method has had measurable impact on predictability in weather forecasting. And so I, I think I've shown you that there is some theory around it, but one thing I would like to argue for is the need for more fundamental understanding of this method, given its clear empirical success. And that's something I've been working on for the last few years, and would like to show you some work uh, concerning that, but um, by looking at the problem in, in the context of inverse problems and not filtering. Um, I pause though and ask if there are any questions at this juncture. Okay, again, I welcome, I see one has just come in the chat. Um, I can't read the chat though, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll read that for you. So David has a question. Do similar derivations hold for uh, multiplicative noise rather than additive? Oh, I see, for multiplicative noise rather than additive? Yeah. Yes. So um, you, you, the, the methodologies I've described do generalize to that setting, both the original filtering that I talked about and the ensemble Kármán filter. Um, I would like to point out with reference to the ensemble Kármán filter, however, that in this picture here, I'm really judging the ability of the ensemble Kármán filter as a state estimator and not its probabilistic forecasting attributes. And so although the ensemble Kármán filter was derived with a probabilistic perspective, one way you can think about it is as an optimizer. Um, it's just an ensemble optimizer. And in that context, you don't need Gaussian noise and nor do you need additive noise. Thank you. Okay, so the, the history of solving inverse problems with filtering goes back um, a long way. 
and specifically transferring ensemble methods to the solution of inverse problems um, very much has its roots in work in the oil industry. These two papers here from the mid 2000s and a, the concurrent paper of Reichs, which I've mentioned before in 2013 is also a very important contribution. Um, so now I'm going to solve what looks like a completely different problem. I'm simply interested in inverting an operator G or a map G um, given data Y, which is found by, as the image of the unknown U under G with the addition of noise. Okay, that's a very different problem. G may be defined by a dynamical process, but may be defined by a static process. It, the, the methodology is immaterial to where G comes from. It's immaterial where G comes from. And um, I will uh, use in this part of the talk, the single bar notation to denote the Euclidean norm and the single bar weighted by A or uh, with the suffix A to denote the Euclidean norm um, with pre-application of the square root of A inverse for any positive definite symmetric A. Right, that's just the covariance weighting when A is a covariance matrix and it's natural in this area. So the, the, in the inverse problem, um, the natural least squares objective function, if eta is Gaussian and additive, is the one that I've written down here. It's just the least squares difference between Y and G of U and roughly you want to make that small. And here I've weighted it by the covariance of the noise, eta, assumed to enter the observation. And eta is assumed to have this covariance and to be centered, mean zero. Um, and then the probabilistic picture, one takes a prior and maps it to the posterior through multiplication or reweighting by e to the minus the objective function. And then of course, normalizing to get back a probability measure. So that as z is like a partition function. So, uh, a really beautiful paper of Del Moral, um, Jasra and Doucet in 2006, um, highlights pre-existing work by others, including uh, Chopin and Radford Neal, um, which showed, a bit, and, and, but their paper has a very nice general picture, which shows how inverse problems of the type that I just described can be approached through filtering. And the idea is this, the, the posterior distribution that we're interested in is found by reweighting mu zero. And the idea is simply to, to reweight incrementally. So I'm going to introduce a series of measures, mu sub n, in which the reweighting, this just should be phi zero, phi zero is multiplied by nh. And then uppercase nh is one. So when I get to n, being equal to uppercase N, I am at the posterior distribution of interest. But the key point about this is that you can view it sequentially as mapping mu zero into mu one, into mu two, into mu three, et cetera. And, and here is the mapping from mu N into mu N plus one. It is itself the solution of an inverse problem uh, with a reweighting in which the objective function, which should be phi zero, is multiplied by h. And if you do this n times where nh is one, then what you get to after n steps is the posterior distribution of interest. So this is an incremental sequence of measures which take you from the prior to the posterior and do so um, in this case in discrete time. I will look at a continuous time analog of it in a moment. Now, the, the beauty of what I just wrote down is that that sequence of measures mu n are governed by a dynamical system, which is a special case of where we started this talk. It's a special case in which the dynamics model is the trivial dynamics on the parameter, although that can be generalized and, that, and that it's important that it can be, but let me just stick with this simple setting. Trivial dynamics on the parameter and uh, one just repeatedly observes um, G applied to the state with noise added. And the noise is just a one over H rescaling of 
in terms of the covariance of the original noise in the original inverse problem. And if one uses this approach and just sets y n plus one dagger equal to the given data y, then the sequence of measures mu n are such that when you step to time uppercase n, you recover the posterior distribution. So this simple slide is really important because it shows that a general inverse problem that's here can be viewed as a filtering problem by formulating the general inverse problem as a Bayesian inverse problem mapping prior to posterior by incrementally breaking up the mapping from the prior to the posterior into a sequence of updates, mu n to mu n plus one, and then writing down a dynamical system whose um, filtering distribution is given by that sequence. And then if you iterate this uppercase n times, you recover mu. And why is that an important conceptual advance? Because it means that anything we do with filtering, anything, any algorithm in filtering can be used to solve an inverse problem. So everything in the entire field of filtering can be transferred to the field of inverse problems. And in particular, ensemble Kalman methods can be transferred to the field of filtering. And to give some insight into that and to showcase the fact that ensemble Kalman methods are self-tuning to the problem, I want to just show you what happens when you apply ensemble Kalman methods two inverse problems formulated using filtering and take a continuous time limit in which their mathematical structure becomes clear. So in that limit, I'm going to take the product of NH to be one as described, but I'm going to let H go to zero and I'm going to define T to be lowercase nh. And then the probability measure mu n will approximate an evolving probability measure mu T and the state Vn of the dynamical system whose filtering distribution is the law that we're interested in at time uppercase n is given by continuous evolution u of t. All right, and so I'll finish the talk with two or three slides on this continuous time limit. Um, before I, I say anything in detail, the central idea here is that these continuous time processes exhibit gradient flow structure, both in the space of U, which is the particle when it's discretized, the state, uh, and in the space of probability measures governed by U. They both have a gradient structure um, and that can be understood in the linear case. So th these are mean field stochastic differential equations, uh, which mean field in that they depend on their own law. So U is governed by a stochastic differential equation. It has a law and U prime is distributed according to the law of U. And expectations here are computed with respect to U prime distributed according to the law of U. Right, so this is, um, this is an equation which has a nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation associated with it. And it remains nonlinear even if the inverse problem is linear. So let me talk about the linear inverse problem setting where G is linear. The Fokker-Planck equation associated with this is still nonlinear, and it has the beautiful property that at time t equals one, if you initialize at the prior measure mu zero, this nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation at time t equals one solves the inverse problem. So that um, enables you to use this flow as a method to solve the inverse problem by particleizing it in the way we talked about earlier and starting initializing it in the prior measure and integrating until time one, right? It can also be viewed as an optimization algorithm if gamma prime is set to zero. And um, I just want to highlight that in so doing, it, you can understand this as self preconditioned gradient descent. So this algorithm, what, why does this algorithm work in terms of optimization? Well, it's 
an algorithm which u, u is now random um, and it evolves according to gradient descent, but it's preconditioned by C of mu, where mu is the law of u and is its own covariance. And a consequence of that is that the rate of convergence of this problem is independent of the conditioning of phi zero, provably in the linear case and empirically in many nonlinear cases. So as you, many of you will know, gradient descent for quadratic form phi zero will be plagued by the conditioning of the linear matrix defining the quadratic form. But this preconditioning uh, undoes that and gives an algorithm which converges at a rate independent of the problem being solved. And there's a stochastic version of this, which I do not have time to describe in detail, but, and there's also associated with that stochastic version, a um, interesting gradient flow structure in the space of probability distributions. But let me just say that what comes out of this is a convergence in the linear Gaussian case, um, an algorithm which converges to the posterior distribution at a universal rate e to the minus t, independent of the problem being solved. So ensemble Kalman methods have this beautiful self-tuning property that in the linear case, their rates of convergence are independent of the problem being solved. And that I believe is one of the reasons for their um, wide empirical success. And is also, I think the starting point for more analysis to try and understand and improve these algorithms. So um, the, if you look at the slides later, you can find a, an example uh, quickly. This was a medical imaging problem and is a good example of why non-differentiable forward map is relevant. We're trying to discover inclusions in uh, tissue, health, unhealthy inclusions of tissue within healthy tissue. And we approach this with a level set method. So working with functions whose level set define the boundaries between healthy and unhealthy tissue. And that, that's a very good example of a problem where the forward map is not differentiable and these ensemble methods are very useful for inversion. All right, thank you for your um, patience in listening to me and uh, the opportunity to present to you. Slides will be available through your website if you want to follow up on the numerous references along the way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andrew, for the talk, very interesting talk. So we have uh, maybe a few minutes now for questions. You can write the questions on the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. I already see that there is one in the, in the chat. Uh, do you use the gradient information for solving in those problems? Yeah, so I, I think the power of these methods, although I explained how they, the, the theorems I have about rates of convergence are in the case where G is linear, um, and so in sense that you have the derivative in that case. Um, the beauty of these methods is that you do not need to compute adjoints. Um, of course, when you can compute adjoints and you should compute them and they are useful, but there are many problems. And this, I gave this as an example where computations of adjoints are difficult because we operate on uh, this level of smooth functions. And then we threshold them using level set to get the um, mapping into the observation space. So in, the, in these problems, adjoint methods are very difficult to use. And so the beauty of the ensemble karma methods is that you do not need the derivative of G. Um, other examples are problems that I work on with my colleague Tapio Schneider, who's a climate modeler at Caltech. And there we are looking at mappings from subgrid scale parameters to uh, macroscopic atmospheric observables. And again, the mapping through the GCM, the general circulation model, is um, very difficult to differentiate and compute adjoints for. And so th these methods, again, are very useful for those kind of problems. Thank you for that question. Um, another question from Denise. Can you comment on the role that localization may have in the ensemble carbon filter from the perspective uh, from your Yes, thank you. So, uh, that's a really good question. Localization is massively important in the weather forecasting example that I showed you. Um, let me just say what localization is. Um, when one computes these covariances um, empirically, um, spurious correlations are often introduced 
um, between spatially far apart points and they are known to make the algorithms behave very badly in many situations and localization is applied to these covariances and that results in making them effective so the this work that i showed you here uses localization um, there is very little analysis of localization and it's a subject where the conjunction of its importance empirically with the lack of mathematical analysis to me means that it's a, it's a good area which is ripe for more fundamental understanding. Um, it is used in inverse problems where the interpretation of localization disappears, but it's still important there for a different reason, um, which is that it, it breaks a, in, in the context of inverse problems, the ensemble methods, when you particleize these algorithms, they remain in subspace defined by the initial span of the particles. And um, that can be a curse because it means that the exploration of the um, energy landscape for the inverse problem is only performed within a pre-prescribed um, linear subspace defined by the initial ensemble. However, um, localization breaks that property and so is, is important for inverse problems for a different reason from the reason that it was initially introduced in state estimation for dynamical systems. So in summary, it's super important, empirically observed to be massively important and very little analyzed. So it's a, a great opportunity for um, applied math. Thank you. Okay, question by Matt. Do you believe there are uh, a finite sample of properties of these algorithms beyond uh, convergence to the mean field limit? Uh, for example, exact integration or quadrature against specific classes of basic functions? Um, I'm not sure I entirely got the question, so let me just rephrase it to see if I've understood correctly. Um, what's the question? Can one make progress with uh, different approximations such as quadrature to recover the covariance matrices? Is that the gist of the question? I think maybe Matt can clarify or yeah, maybe Joseph can clarify. Roughly yes. Matt is saying roughly yes. Roughly yes, yeah. Yeah, I think I think he's asking if the points that one gets have quadrature prop quadrature like properties. Um, Maybe yeah. that's my interpretation. Thank you. So thanks for the question, Matt. Um, I would say that the the way to, to see that connection most clearly, clearly is through what's called the unscented Kalman inversion or unscented Kalman filter, in which the approximation of the covariances is done not using particles as I've done here, but by using quadrature, as you suggest. And um, in a nutshell, I think those methods work well when the dimension of the state space is small, um, but they tend to be outperformed by the Kalman approach when the dimension of the state space is large. But there are interesting problems where the dimension of the state space is small in inverse problems, where nonetheless the evaluation of G um, takes you through an intermediate, very high dimensional space before you map into the data space. And for those problems, the uncentered approach and others based on quadrature, I think can also be very effective. And uh, empirical evidence from uh, Daniel Huang, who is a postdoc at Caltech and previously worked with Charbel Fahat at Stanford. He has ve very good empirical evidence that the uncentered methods based on quadrature uh, can provide much more controlled and effective solutions, both of the inverse problem from an optimization point of view and a sampling point of view. So I think there's more to be understood about that connection to quadrature and uncentered methods. But I, typically I would expect them only to be good in low dimensional state space situations. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe we can take one, one last question from the chat uh, from uh, Dallas. As an extension to the localization question, what do you think can be learned about the case when the number of particles is less than the dimensionality of the state space in this interacting particle system yeah. methods? 
Right, so let me say two things about that. Firstly, the, the idea that the number of particles has to be higher than the dimension of the state space from the point of view of recovering the signal is not, not the right way to think about this problem. The, the reason that the weather forecasting example succeeds, now the, the weather forecasting example, the dimension of the state space is billions. And the, the, the ensemble method is not used with billions or even millions of particles, it's used with hundreds. The reason it's still successful, and you can see it's successful here with, um, so here with the uh, an, a, a simulation study using incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, but here with the real weather forecast uh, compared against real data. The reason it's successful is because it really needs to be able, if you think about this from control theory perspective, the key issue is observability. And you need to observe enough, which means you need to have enough particles to control the unstable space of the dynamics. And there is a lot of work in this direction in the geophysical community. But I think that is the right rule of thumb to have about filtering in dynamical systems, that um, you need the dimension of the particle space to be large enough for observability, which for chaotic systems is related to the dimension of the unsta unstable subspace or the, the number of um, positively Lyapunov exponents. And in inverse problems, the key, the, often inverse problems have an intrinsic low dimensionality and, and lower dimension, even though they may be in, infinite dimensional in that you are looking for a field, there is an intrinsic finite dimensional approximation that will recover the right solution to an, a controllable error. And um, the ensemble space needs to be large enough to, con to recover that. So I think the, the take home is that it's not right to think that you need to have more particles than states, than the dimension of the state. You may need to in some situations, but in many of these high dimensional problems, that's not the right way to think. Thank you for that question, it's very helpful. Okay, and um, maybe if you have time, Andrew, for one last question by sure. Chen. Um, so what, what, what kind of inverse problems will this filtering method fail? It's very robust. Um, I, I, I've not encountered it failing um, if you spend time with it. And typically it's fairly good out of the box. I would say a, a question that's more concerning to me is um, it's competitive with competitiveness with other methods. And I think that's why we need more analysis to understand quantitatively its complexity and accuracy and the trade-off between the two. Um, it is, it never fails to surprise me with how robust it is. It can fail um, if you have multiple modes in your objective function, um, but even then it can, that can be dealt with by have stochastic versions of it. But th th I would say that's the principal area in which I've seen it failing is when it can get stuck in several modes of an optimization landscape. But broadly speaking, it's much better at dealing with that problem than um, methods that compute the gradient. And uh, I have a recent paper with Andrew Duncan, uh, Ollie Dunbar and Mary Therese Wolfram in which we use uh, the theory of averaging and homogenization to show that Roughly speaking, if the separation of the particles is greater than a small length scale in a non-convex energy landscape, then um, the ensemble method will behave much better than methods, methods that compute the derivative. So I've, I've kind of answered the question more into <laughs> when does the ensemble method work well? Um, it does work very well in rough energy landscapes. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Like, thanks a lot, Andrew, for having you here. It was very interesting. Thank you. Hopefully, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, we'll meet you in person next time. Yeah, I will, I look forward to that. Uh, thanks everyone for joining the. This is the last seminar of, of the fall, so and I am looking for, forward to see you in the next sprint. So, okay, take care, everyone.